don't judge a book by the cover, but that cover does make the sale or legal precedent. Many a publishing house made their original reputation and profits by publishing reprints of classics long out of copyright, or ones that predated the concept of copyright. The free reprinting of ancient and recent classics for cheap was a ready strategy to establish a business or make a profit less than a century ago. These editions could be sold on name and demand alone, with little to catch the eye or please the aesthetic sense. By the mid-1800s, though, the market was glutted. By the mid-1900s, it took more effort to get people interested in books. And by today, books can be printed on what is essentially near on demand. Thus, a certain practice of misleading covers was developed to attract attention to these books. Often, the books were established classics most readers would recognize, but the covers were… random as to draw general attention. Established in 1987, Wordsworth, or Wordsworth Editions, does the opposite of that, or maybe the exact same thing for the opposite reasons. A British printing house, Wordsworth's name, not the poet, is synonymous with cheap editions for education or pleasure. Online and in the bookselling world, Wordsworth editions have a unique reputation. It is not due to content or quality either, but it is just as surface level. A Wordsworth cover is unmistakable because only a Wordsworth cover looks like a Wordsworth cover. There is a legal reason for this design decision. Wordsworth editions covers are legendary. The okay, the bad, and the outright bizarre. These covers have to be savored to taste. This is a historical art gallery for book covers that could only exist at this moment in mass history. Wordsworth, otherwise known as Wordsworth Editions, is a business with a noble goal, but in opportune style. Founded in 1987 on the established centuries-old formula of reprint the classics for cheap, Wordsworth Editions launched their One Pound Classics paperbacks in 1992. That is what Wordsworth was originally most famous for, selling entire classical public domain books for one pound, about $1.30, or now about two pounds, $2.64 today, due to inflation. It has been about 30 years after all. The plan was both logical and profitable. Wordsworth mainly make their profits from students who have to buy books for school or class. Their editions are cheap, will only last a few reads, not decorate a shelf, but are utilitarian and, most of all again, cheap. Drawing from the ever so lucrative public domain or public commons, the Wordsworth catalog has grown to be about 200 titles today, but it is a catalog is about exclusive as Project Gutenberg. The only thing that distinguishes Wordsworth is the brand and short intros placed before books. Those introductions are rather sparse, though, as compared to Penguin or a university press. As with anything, on the Wordsworth budget, one gets the Wordsworth quality. The books generally use an 8.5 font, instead of the normal size 12 or 11 font, to save room and cost. While not known for their style or durability, they do get the job done overall. What is more questionable is how Wordsworth decorates their editions. Originally, like most small printing houses, Wordsworth used public domain art for their covers, mostly sourced from the Bridgman Art Library, but there's no clear catalog for every Wordsworth release. Like everything else about Wordsworth, these were serviceable. They were not spectacular, but matched the contents of the book and created a warm and inviting style. The covers had simple editing, such as having part of the painting overlay the title label. They're Romeo and Juliet covers, for example. One has Romeo and Juliet's heads over the title label, so they take the foreground. If any of the covers in the style look familiar, you probably saw them in school. Wordsworth did, and still does make, international bulk sales, which compose about 40% of their overall business profit. These filled school libraries or that bookshelf by the play area in first grade. These old Wordsworth covers are generic and not spectacular really, but there was an element more than other publishing houses that churned out bulk copy. For an example of this era, here's Wordsworth Editions 1995 publication of Sir Walter Scott's Ivanhoe, 1819. It is a bit beat up, but it is a softcover edition. 
The introduction is only two pages, but it gives a brief background on the plot and a biography on Sir Walter Scott. This edition says it was printed and bound in Denmark by Norhaven, and typeset in the UK by Anthony Gray. The cover design is bland, but serviceable. The back of the book credits it to Robert Matthias, Publishing Workshop, and the painting on the cover is The Battle of Trente, 1350, by Octave Penguilly, 1857. Modern Wordsworth Editions covers are not that. Modern Wordsworth covers are confusingly awkward compared to their predecessors. Gone is the sensible title plate instead being replaced by this flat white font on a black background. The white on black is sensible, if bland, cover design, but the worst part is all the wasted space on the cover. The only images on Modern Wordsworth covers are usually a center aligned image with white borders. It looks rather slapped on top. And that is not even getting into what the images usually are. This creates a lot of empty dead space on each side and below on the cover. The design would just be boring if not for the perplexingly iconic Wordsworth images usually used on them. Replacing the classic art covers are these. Hmm. Punishment indeed. Modern Wordsworth Editions covers are not hideous, but they are uncanny and artificial with the stilted Photoshop stock photo illustration style. A lot of these covers are reminiscent of mannequins in a stage scene or on display. In many cases, the covers are basically collage photoshops. The cover for Three Men in a Boat literally has the hats photoshopped on in the image. Photoshopped on. Beside their odd quality, a few of these covers seem to suggest the artist did not even really read the books. A certain few cover images were thrown together from what looks to be popular culture or just Google searches. A too easy example of this is the Frankenstein cover which is… interesting? Funnily enough, two of the Dracula covers are not that bad, the bat one is actually above average, but the Photoshop stock photo edit one is… odd. Then compare those to the original public domain art covers from the 90s. Remember, Wordsworth is a budget brand with a budget. The usual criticism of these Wordsworth covers is that they are fundamentally unappealing, but other times there are fundamental errors or mistakes on this variety of patented black cover. Take a look at the Iliad cover. Actually, not too hard, but see if there is something off. It is not a major mistake, but it becomes obvious to sensitive eyes. As Simple Perception on Reddit pointed out, it appears the cover designer simply forgot to fill out the empty spaces within the letters, such as in the E and O. Once again, take this Wordsworth cover and compare it to the older Wordsworth editions. One looks like a bad ripoff of God of War, and one shows the main crisis of the Iliad through art. Wordsworth does have another edition of a combined Iliad and Odyssey, it's competent but boring even compared to the classic art covers. Then there is their version of Ben-Hur. Wow. The Odyssey and Aeneid were not spared this style of cover either. Neither appears to have any errors like the Iliad cover, but they still look like cheap action movie renders. All three have that same stilted art style reminiscent of cheap romance books. The only word that can describe these covers is uncanny. The Aeneid is the best example. The figure is obviously photoshopped into the scene. It is overbrushed, giving it this impossible smoothness. Then this fellow, who can only be presumed to be Aeneas, is giving the reader this indecipherable look from beneath his helmet. Once again, they did not used to look like this. There are in fact several different Wordsworth versions of these book covers that looked relatively nice. Other times, the covers are astoundingly generic, but still retain that photoshopped eeriness. Wordsworth's Sherlock Holmes covers inspire this lonely emotion that has no name. The best of Sherlock Holmes is this, all things considered, OK Street sign for Baker Street. A bit flat, but representative. Then you have the cover of The Adventures and Memoirs of Sherlock Holmes, which is literally just a picture of the actual front door of 221B Baker Street. Wordsworth cannot be accused of false advertising in their covers. Then there is The Hound of the Baskervilles and the Valley of Fear, which is a chair photoshopped in front of this oversized, unmarked library shelf. Would it not have been easier to buy a stock photo of a library than use that? The fact the chair has a glare on it makes it even more bizarre. The books are just flat in the background and without markings. 
A study in Scarlet and the Sign of the Four takes the cake, though. Holmes and Watson's iconic hats photoshopped on a hanger. Literally just photoshopped there. Credit to Wordsworth for this one, though. The background is in fact Scarlet. Wordsworth even offers the Sherlock Holmes collection, but to be fair, they do offer one with covers a person would actually display on a bookshelf and not just use for class one day. Then there is the Master Margarita cover, which is actually, well, it, it is drawn, but um, look, stepping out of the video for a moment, I know this is Behemoth, a character who is actually in the book, but why sell the book like this? I think that bottle of vodka was photoshopped into the image. Then again, covers of Master Margarita really do like using the gun-toting demon cat. Actually, this cover aesthetic is so popular, I think it sells the book better. This one is good for how bizarre it is. How about the infamously indecipherable Wordsworth's Uncle Tom's Cabin cover? The original editions from Wordsworth are actually pretty okay. For one black cover edition, they even kept a bit of the stylization from earlier editions. Then they came up with this. It is unclear why he is making that face. It looks like he ate a lemon. To Wordsworth's credit again, they realized that version was probably not going to sell many copies, and changed it to a cover with a slightly more sensible expression and style. I think Wordsworth is aware of the reception of their covers. Do not rag on the style too much though. It can work, to a certain degree. Joseph Conrad's Lord Jim, Nostromo, and Heart of Darkness sort of benefit from this photoshopped hyperreal style. The cover for Heart of Darkness and other stories is bordering on above average for what it is. The cover for The Secret Agent, though, is in a similar style, but simply less appealing for how it's portrayed. Almire's Folly and The Rover is very slapdash and not really coherent at all, not appropriate for a writer like Joseph Conrad. The Lingard trilogy, though, has this very point-and-click adventure game presentation style, with the characters just standing there, and this woman's head that looks like it came straight out of The Sims' character creator. Compare this catched Walmart cover to the actual cover, though. It is low quality, but maybe you can notice a few of the differences. Yes, the Lingard trilogy has alternate covers. At first it may just look like a trick of the low quality, but there are in fact differences between the covers. It's not the low quality fool in your eyes. The man's face is different, the other figure is wearing face paint, and the woman's face is different. It's very odd because it shows that the faces used on Wordsworth covers may generally be composites of different faces. The mouth, eyes, and noses, or at least the area around them, are different. Very odd. One thing the uncanniness of Wordsworth covers excel at is portraying horror and unease. The issue? It's always used for the wrong books. Take the infamous exemplar of Wordsworth covers, Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment. The cover does look ridiculous for context. Not an appropriate face for a Russian classic, but it does convey uneasiness. It is an odd uneasiness, but everything here is basically competent. The Wordsworth version of The Man in the Iron Mask would legitimately make a great horror cover. Look at this. The indecipherable stance of torment, the two visible eyes, and the hyperreal teeth bared to the viewer, all in dirty stained colors. It all expresses tones associated with horror. The problem? This is the cover for The Man in the Iron Mask otherwise known as part 3 of the novel The Vicomte of Bragion, ten years later. A book that cannot be considered horror even in the barest sense. Still, Wordsworth cover art can have a place where it is proficient. Do not write it off altogether. Out of all the covers of this era from Wordsworth, the covers for Dostoevsky's works are the most fascinating. They all use this desaturated minimalist style with figures like drawing models set against geometric backgrounds. Maybe not totally appropriate for Dostoevsky, outside Russian bleakness, but these covers are stylistically coherent and appealing to a degree. It should be obvious they do not technically originate with Wordsworth. The style itself is called Neo-Suprematism, or Suprematism, and was an avant-garde Russian movement based on geometric shapes. Nearly all of these covers are from the Russian artist Kazimir Malevich, such as the cover of Notes from the Underground, is an edited version of Malevich's Two Figures in a Landscape. The cover of The House of the Dead and the Gambler is Malevich's two male figures, and so on and so forth. Technically then, these covers are edits of Malevich's paintings, usually with just the colors adjusted. They have been modified in a unique way. 
It is a good remix to decorate a cover and deserves to cover the entire book, not be hemmed in by this blackness. If one wants to look on their own, all these covers are available in their grandeur on Wordsworth's website. So what made this unique Wordsworth Photoshop style develop? It was likely legally forced to. Wordsworth Editions, along with Oxford University Press, got into a rather notorious legal scuffle with Penguin back in 1998-1999. Essentially, back in 1998, Wordsworth attempted to change their book covers to this blue style with the Wordsworth Classics header, some of which are still in circulation. Penguin was suspicious Wordsworth Editions slash Wordsworth Classics was attempting to mimic the trademarked Penguin slash Penguin Classics cover style and branding. Penguin then sued the much smaller Wordsworth Printing House. The two companies settled out of court, but likely due to Penguin's demands, Wordsworth had to change their blue covers to red. This happened back in 1998-1999, but what does it have to do with the patented Wordsworth black covers? It is likely this legal exchange spooked Wordsworth going into the 2000s. It required Wordsworth to develop a style that could not be mistaken for any other brand. Such a small printing house could not survive extended legal battles with massive corporations. This becomes more obvious in the news articles. Eleven months ago, Penguin issued Wordsworth editions in Oxford University Press with writs accusing them of rebranding their titles to mimic the distinctive Penguin Classics livery. Both accused parties settled out of court and were forced, at immense cost, to redesign their covers to make them more distinguishable from the opposition. Wordsworth changing their covers to red was only a brief fix before they converted to their modern standards of branding. The use of public domain art was also mostly abandoned as to not cause any more mistakes or legal injunctions from the much larger Penguin brand legal department. That is why this unique cover style was adopted in the 2000s and 2010s. It was an easy, reproducible, and noticeable style Wordsworth could use for branding. No one is going to mistake these Wordsworth Classics covers for any other Classics line covers. These covers then are technically not confusingly bad, but confusingly unique on purpose. They are produced in this quick, plastic style to keep a consistent brand no one would want to copy. As Imaginary Cup 8426 on Reddit has already observed, Wordsworth covers look like that because Wordsworth makes most of their profit by selling in bulk internationally to classrooms. I think they make them hideous on purpose so that you don't feel bad about throwing it in a backpack and letting it beat to shit by your elementary statistics textbook. Wordsworth's collector's editions are more appealing, if more expensive, with their kitschy art style, but those are the copies to buy and keep around on a bookshelf if you want to. The normal Wordsworth fair is to be destroyed in a classroom. Or on your own time. Wordsworth classics are meant to be subpar because they are disposable. Wordsworth Classics covers are interesting because they are this very unique niche style that appeals on their bizarre appearance. Wordsworth covers are probably 4chan's lit board's only meme of note. Beside, well. One can even make their own Wordsworth cover. The style is so easy to imitate, one might even mistake these lit parody covers for real. Wait, that one is actually real. It is hard to say if Wordsworth's notoriety is based on fame or infamy, or maybe just a good book cover. One cannot doubt Wordsworth, or their hired artists, did develop a noteworthy style. As of recent years with their collector's editions, Wordsworth has transitioned to more appealing or sensible covers, a type a person would see on display and not at the bottom of the sales bin. These bombastic Wordsworth covers will always be in circulation though, and will always be in circulation in some people's minds and hearts. They carry on an old printing tradition that will last until the last book is printed. Wordsworth is the printing house that embraced a futurist interpretation of this Photoshop stock photo style era. Generic covers pale in comparison to the emotions aroused by Wordsworth classics. All these covers can never lose their uncanny charm. To end with a quote from the actual Wordsworth, Earth has not anything to show more fair, dull would he be of soul who could pass by, a sight so touching in its majesty.
I'd like to give a classical thank you to my wordy supporter, the Gel Samini family.